Okay, so my name is Kevin Connor. I'm Chief Engineer with GetUp Cloud. I'm also a co-author on the second edition of Kubernetes in Action, along with Marco Luxa. Hi, I'm Manish Ramshikar. I'm a software engineer at Microsoft, focusing on security. Um, I'm a member of Kubernetes CDOT, maintainer of Secret Store CSI driver from Seattle, Washington. Okay, so here is the agenda for today. Uh, we're going to talk briefly about Cell. Uh, then we're going to introduce you to Cell Playground, uh, basically a playground where you can test out Cell expressions. Uh, then we're going to give you a deep dive on validating admission policies, mutating admission policies, and then basically show you uh, the validating admission policies and mutating admission policies in action. Okay, so let's start with a brief overview of Cell. So what is Cell? Cell is common expression language. It's an efficient way to evaluate expressions, especially for applications where performance is critical, like Kubernetes. Cell is non-Turing complete. It avoids constructs like loops and recursions, making it predictable in terms of execution time. This design ensures that Cell can evaluate expressions safely and quickly, with no risk of running indefinitely. Uh, Cell evaluates expressions in linear time and is optimized for speed, so it performs very well in production environments. Cell is built to be embedded in applications, providing an easy way to integrate policy checks directly into your system without needing any additional dependencies. This makes it versatile and useful across various software environments. Cell also allows for extensibility through its context, meaning you can add custom functions or provide additional data, the cell reference in expressions. Cell is designed to use minimal CPU and memory, which is critical in environments with limited resources. This efficiency allows you to evaluate expressions even in resource-constrained environments like a Kubernetes cluster. And on the screen here, we have an example of what a cell expression might look like. Uh, it's natural syntax and it has dot accessors with the ability to have macros or functions that the integrator provides. Okay, so the cell language has a straightforward syntax as we looked at in the previous slide. Uh, cell was designed to be embedded into applications. So each cell program is an expression that evaluates to a single value. And then they're typically short one-liners that can be easily inlined in Kubernetes API objects. Uh, in addition to the cell community libraries, Kubernetes also includes additional cell libraries. Uh, and then we have a list here to name a few. So if you look at URL manipulation to make it easier and safer to process URLs, uh, the Kubernetes extension provides a is URL function that you can check if a string is a URL and then a URL accessor that you can convert a string to a URL. And once you have the URL object, you have accessors like get host, get scheme, through which you can manipulate it. Uh, then the next thing is there is also a um, function for getting quantity strings. And then in addition to that, the, there is regular expression libraries, and then there is also an authorizer. So in cell expressions in the API, you could use this authorizer to perform authorization checks for the principal of the request. And this is just a list of some of the ones that we know, but beyond this, there are other libraries that are actually supported. Okay, so before we get onto the meat of it, so I'm gonna introduce you to Cell Playground. Uh, this is an open source project which was created by the company I work for. And the whole point of this was really to give people an opportunity to play with Cell, but to do it in a safe place. So this is what it looks like. Don't worry if you can't see that, I'm gonna do a demo of it shortly. And the link at the top, the URL there, is how you get access to it. So if you wanna give it a go, uh, please do. So it was designed to be a safe play space for people to uh, play around with Cell, to test Cell expressions, to test the integration with various Kubernetes features. It's, you can, you know, you're not deploying into a cluster, so there's no risk of breaking anything. It's uh, a Golang application, which is compiled to WASM and then downloaded and run in the browser. So there's no uh, external, so there's no backend service for this. It's all local, all your information stays local. 
And at the moment, what we support are the evaluations of plain cell expressions, the integration points with webhooks, and also the integration points with validating admission policies. Okay, so let's swap over. So this is Cell Playground. So at the moment, you can see uh, there's the standard self expression uh, mode that we have. On the left hand side here, uh, this is where the expressions, you can put the expression that you want to test. Uh, top right here is the data that gets fed into the expression when it gets evaluated, and you get the output of the expression on the bottom right here. So if we just run that, you can see this is very simple. It's just a check of an overdraft, it says that we can uh, withdraw 700, which is great. Uh, but we also get an idea of the cost of the expression in the bottom right here. If we change mode and go to the validating admission policy, which is what we're here to talk about, it becomes slightly more complicated, but it's still following the same structure. Left-hand side is the, uh, the uh, expression. In this case, it's a uh, proper Kubernetes resource. So we have a validating admission policy here. And then the top right are the various inputs that the validation admission policy will get from the API server. So we run this, and the output's slightly different. It's a concertina output. Here we have a single validation expression, so we're only seeing one uh, validation response, but that's evaluating to true. If I go and show something more complex, like the variable one here, we have four different variables plus a validation expression. That will show you the evaluation of each individual variable as well, so you can see how it gets evaluated within the context of the policy. And we do that, the same thing for match conditions and also for the audit annotations. Okay, so that's a, a quick introduction to Cell Playground. Okay, so we looked at cell expressions, and then we also looked at how you can use a cell playground to validate cell expressions. Uh, so the next thing that we're here to talk about, the core of the talk, is admission policies, and this one is specifically validating admission policies. So first thing is validating admission policies are designed to be an alternate for validating webhooks for many common use cases. Unlike webhooks, which require an external service, these policies are handled directly within the Kubernetes API server, making them more efficient and easier to manage. Since they run in the Kube API server, they reduce the need for network calls, uh, which means lower latency and reliable policy enforcement as they are evaluated natively. Validating admission policies use the common expression language to declare the validation rules of a policy. Each validating admission policy consists of three components. The first one being the validating admission policy. That is the actual policy definition where you specify the rules and the conditions that must be met. And the second component is validating admission policy binding. This connects a policy to a specific resource or namespace, allowing you to target policies of certain workloads. Uh, and then the third component is parameter resources. These allow you to parameterize policies, enabling flexible, reusable rules that can adjust based on different inputs. At least a validating admission policy and a binding needs to exist for it to actually have any effect. And then in terms of uh, the validation action, you can basically configure that to either deny, warn, or audit requests. Uh, deny, if the validation fails, the request is going to be denied. Uh, if you have one, then basically the client gets a warning that they're not allowed to do a particular action. And then audit is in addition to the warning. The validation failure is also as part of audit. And then deny and warn are not to be used together because this combination needlessly duplicates the validation failure both in the API response body and the HTTP warning uh, headers. So with validating admission policies, cell expressions are central to defining uh, conditions, variables, uh, message expression, audit annotation, and validations. Uh, so if you look at match conditions, cell expressions can define match conditions to specify 
when a policy should apply based on the attributes of the incoming request. So this is in addition to match labels, namespace selector, object selectors that you have in the binding. Then the next one is variables. So you can use cell to set variables that simplify complex expressions and that can be reused in, as part of evaluation. Uh, the validations, these are the core rules that get evaluated. So cell expressions validate whether a resource request meets specific requirements. And then you have audit annotations. So cell can also annotate the requests based on what decision is being made uh, to track policy actions and violations. And then the last one being message expression. So this is where you configure an expression so that uh, the client gets more detailed message if a violation exists. And then in terms of what these cell expressions have access to, uh, they typically have access to the con uh, contents of the admission request or response um, organized into cell variables. And here's a list of the cell variables that they have access to. The first one is object. So this is the object of the incoming request and the value is null for delete. And then the old object is the existing object. The value is null for create requests. And then the request is basically attributes of the admission request and the params is optional parameters that you have configured that is used for uh, evaluating the conditions. Uh, and then the namespace object is the Kubernetes namespace object. This value is set to null if it's, if you're evaluating a cluster scope resource. Um, and then the authorizer, the cell authorizer, uh, this can be used to perform authorization checks for the principle that the request is being made for. Okay, so now we know a little bit about validating admission policies. <clears throat> we know that they, uh, they're declarative. We know that they run embedded within the API server, so there's no external network access required. We know that they use cell for defining their policies, and the best, uh, the best reason for using them, as far as I'm concerned, is we don't need to use a webhook. So anybody who's used webhooks will know how that feels. Okay, so we're going to take you on a little journey of uh, validating emission policies, take you through a, a, the, the kind of journey that you might experience if you were learning how to use it uh, yourselves. So the first thing we're going to look at is really where do you start? It's, it's probably with something like this, a very simple policy. Uh, this one here is, uh, it's matching for pods, the create and update verbs on pods. And what it's trying to do is it's trying to prevent containers getting into your system that have requested privileged access. So the expression at the bottom here is uh, fairly simple. We have a, a has macro there which says uh, that it's the expression, uh, sorry, the resource is going to be valid if it doesn't have a security context or if it doesn't have a privileged set or if the privileged value is not true. So that's it. So we'll show this in action. So. Okay, so this is the policy that we showed on the slide just to show you that I'm going to deploy the same thing. So that gets deployed. The policy binding. Uh, can you read that? It looks a bit small. Let me increase the size of that. Is that any better? Yep. Okay, so this is the policy binding. What we're doing is we are uh, matching on namespace selector here with environment demo. Now the only namespace in this cluster that we have that matches that is called demo. Uh, and the policy name is deny privileged example. So that's a policy that we previously defined and our validating action is deny. So if anybody tries to uh, submit a request that contravenes this policy, then we're gonna deny the uh, request. So we will apply that as well. So now we're going to test it out. Here is a simple pod. It's just deploying Nginx, so nice and easy. And it's asking for privileged access. So we will try it and see what we get. Okay, so that's what we wanted to see. The request has failed. Uh, we have a message here, which has come from our policy, which says the pod has at least one privileged container. So that's great. But what happens when you start talking about controllers who are creating pods, how does that work? Well, let's give that a try. Let's try it with the deployment and see. 
So the deployment, as you can see, is essentially the same as the pod. It's just wrapped in within deployment uh, structure itself. So if we run that, we see that actually that succeeded. Now that's not what we wanted to see. What we wanted was for that to fail. So let's go and take a look and see what we have here. So we can see we have a deployment and we can also see that we have a replica set. Let's take a look at the deployment first and see what we get. Okay. So if we scroll down to the bottom, we can see that, okay, there's a message there that says replica failed, but there's nothing really of interest there. So let's look at the replica set and see what that says. Again, down at the bottom, we start to see lots of uh, error messages that are coming from our policy. So the reason this has happened is, you know, thanks to the good asynchronicity of Kubernetes and controllers, the replica controller is the client that's making the request. So it's, it's creating the, the pod. It's the one that gets the error message. So it's logging it in its status. So now we have to go back to the drawing board. And, sorry, let me just go back and I'll close that down. So I'm not going to use that again. So now we have to go back to the drawing board and we do a second version of it. Uh, this one, what we've done is we've extended the resource rules that we're using so that we are also looking at the other types that contain containers. Uh, and actually, if, I know this is just, I know we're not doing init containers and ephemeral stuff, I'm trying to keep it simple, but we're just looking at the, the normal containers within the pods. We ha are also having to extend, let's see if this works, wrong one. So we have, that's not very good. So we have got three validation rules now instead of uh, one. The reason for this is because the, actual, the structures of the resources are different, right? Pods, the containers are based directly in the spec. Uh, deployments, et cetera, they have a, a template uh, which contains everything. Cron job has a job template which, which contains everything. So we need to put guards there to make sure that only the appropriate resource will evaluate that expression. So let's give that a try. Okay. So this is the policy that we're using, just to show that it's the, oops, sorry, to show that it's the same one. So we'll give that a go. That's now configured. And we will go back and we will try the deployment again. Okay, so now we get the error message. So that was what we wanted to see. So when somebody is actually creating the deployment, they're the ones who see the error because that's where it makes sense. Now there are two real issues with this. If we go back to the policy and show that. You know, this is quite a messy policy. We are using the has macro all over the place. Uh, we also uh, are duplicating, duplicating a lot of code. There must be some way to clear this, this uh, to clean this up. Another issue is that if you uh, look at the policy itself, you will see that there are lots of errors that have been created right down at the bottom in status. So these are the errors. Now what is happening here is that when we deploy our policy, there's a, a type checking stage that takes place. This takes all the resources that you've said that you're interested in, and it will compare the structure with what you're executing with the expressions. If there's a, a, a mismatch, then it creates an error message, okay? Now we know that we have different types with different structures. We are expecting there to be mismatches because the expressions are not going to, to handle everything, uh, but the type checker doesn't know that, okay? So it's creating all these errors for it. So is there a way that we can deal with this as well? Well, as it turns out, there is. Oops, wrong way. So there are two things that we can do. First is to start using variables. So these are uh, essentially sub-expressions which will be evaluated on demand, only if they're ever referenced, and they will be evaluated once. And we can also use the optional operator, which is the dot question mark that you can see there. Now what the optional operator means, uh, does, is it, it says that from this point onwards, something could be missing, right? I know it could be missing, I'm telling you it might not be there. 
and we have an opportunity to set up a default value, which is what our value does. So now we have uh, three expressions at the, sorry, three variables at the top, pod containers, workload containers, and cron job containers. They are using the optional operator to say, if this exists, then we will take the value of containers, otherwise we'll just have an empty list. And just for uh, ease of use, we've created a fourth variable which just concat concatenates that all together, right? So now we end up with one expression which says there may or may not be a security context with a privileged. If there is, make sure that it's not true. Okay, so that's much uh, simpler. So let's try that out and see what happens with that. Okay, so this is the policy that we were just talking about. I'll deploy that instead. Okay, and if we do a, go back to the policies and describe that, we can see that uh, this is there and it's clean, there are no errors there. Now really, uh, we, we've kind of cheated a bit here because the reason there are no errors is because we moved all the bits which would cause errors into variables and that doesn't get type checked. So <laughs> it's a bit of a cheat, but it works, it's clean. Okay, so that's that bit there. Uh, right, so going back. So the next thing you might move on to is, okay, you, you want to do something like uh, restrict, or sorry, you want to uh, enforce a minimum number of replicas, for example, that's the common example that you see. Uh, this is something that you want to configure using parameters because you want the ability to create uh, so you want the ability to update that value, but without, re restart, re without recreating the policy or updating the policy. So you define a CRD. Uh, we have an example called demo param here, which I'll show you the CRD uh, in a minute. It's very simple. And we use that within our expressions with uh, params.spec.replicas and use that just to enforce the policy. The binding that you see on the right-hand side when you see the param ref there, what that is doing is it's binding the policy to a particular instance of that resource, of that CR. So this one is in the namespace config and it has a name min replicas. So let's give that a go as well. Okay. Oh, sorry, wrong one. Okay, so this is the policy. Just to show you that I'm doing the same policy, we will apply that. Uh, the policy binding, the same binding. Actually, I forgot to do the CRD, so I'll do the CRD first. So this is the CRD. It's very simple. All it has is a single integer in there called replicas. So deploy that. And the parameters we're going to use, again, this in namespace config has a name min replicas, has a replica value of three. So we will deploy that. And now we'll deploy the binding. Okay, so let's give this a go and see what happens. I'm just going to go down to the command line for this. Right, so I'm going to call it nginx because I'm going to deploy nginx. Let's see what happens. Okay, so we get an error message that says deployment spec replicas is set to one, but should be at least three. So the three is coming from our parameters that we've, spe we've specified. We can try with three and we see that it gets created. Okay, so that's how to use a parameter. Oops. But that's not where we stop with parameters. Uh, oops, <laughs> sorry, I keep coming back to the hummingbird. Uh, so now the next step would be, okay, well, we can, can use parameters, but actually what we really want to do is we want to have different values of the parameter per namespace. So how do we do this? So you go back, you do a bit of research, and you actually find that it's uh, fairly easy to do this. The only thing you need to do is change your binding so that it does not specify the namespace within the param ref. When API server sees that, what it will do is it will default the namespace to the same namespace as the resource that's coming in, right? So if somebody's creating it uh, in test, then it will use that parameter within the test namespace. If it's, used, if it's deploying it to prod, then it will, do, it, it will pull it from the prod namespace, okay? 
So we'll do a show this in action as well. So this is the changed binding. As you can see, there's no namespace there. We will apply that. And now these are the parameters that we are going to deploy. So again, test, we have three replicas. Prod, we have five replicas. Deploy that. OK, so that deployed. Now if you go back and try it with test, we'll see that it's saying, OK, we should have at least three. And if we do it with prod, oops, then now it's saying there should be at least five. And you can take a look at the, oops, helps if you use my say. Uh, so the, these are the, the uh, parameters that we have defined and the namespaces that they're in. Okay, so it's matching. Prod was five, test was three. Okay, but that's not where you stop with parameters, right? So far, we have it, uh, created policies and we've evaluated them against a single parameter. Right? It doesn't matter whether it's in the namespace that the resource is deploying in or whether it's in a, a config namespace of some kind. You can actually use many parameters, right? But they all have to, there are some gotchas, right? The first one is that you are defining the type of the parameter within the policy itself. So you're restricted to one type. The second thing is uh, that you, uh, you define a selector which chooses the parameters the uh, API server will, ident will, will identify all the parameters that uh, match your selector, and for every single one it finds, it will execute your policy. Every combination of that policy has to succeed for the admission to work, right? So here we're gonna do something which is actually, uh, may look a bit strange, but it makes sense. So we have a parameter kind, we're actually gonna use pod disruption budget here. But we're also going to have our resource rules match on pod disruption budgets, right? So when they get created or updated, our object will be a PDB, and the parameter will be a PDB. But the parameter will be every single PDB that's already in that namespace. So we can check to see whether the incoming one clashes in some way with the ones that are already deployed. So if we go back to this, So this is the policy that we're going to use. Uh, at the top here, we have two variables. All those are really doing is making it easy so that we don't have to keep typing that again. They're just copying the, uh, the, the labels that we have, right? Now we have an expression here, which is checking to see whether the PDB that's already deployed and the one that we're about to uh, test against are the same. If it is, then we just, we, we don't care because it's replacing what's there, so they're not gonna clash. The next two are just simple expressions which check to see whether the labels that are there, the match labels of which are in, uh, in this case, in the incoming object, if they're a subset of the PDB. So go through every single label, check if it exists, check if the values are the same. If, it do, if, if that is true, then it's obviously a subset and it's gonna clash. And the last one is the opposite direction, in this case for PDBs. So if either of those are true, then we know that we're gonna have a clash and that's what the validating expressions are going to say. So let's deploy that. We'll deploy the binding. And we'll go and have a look at some PDBs. So this one here, is, there's obviously nothing deployed at the moment. This one su should succeed. It's got labels of app being app one and service being service one. So you apply that, and that works. PDB two has app, again, app one, but the service is service two, so they're not clashing. Deploy that one, and that one works. PDB three, on the other hand, has app of app one and service from service one. Now we know that they clash with PDB1 because those are the only labels that are deployed in, in PDB1. Uh, but it also includes sub uh, label in there as well. So PDB1 is a subset of this. If we deploy that, then we get an error message from our policy 
which says the match labels in PDB1 match a subset of the match labels in this PDB. Okay, so that worked. And then PDB4, look at that. All it contains is that. So it's a subset of the existing PDB1 and the existing PDB2, because they were the only two that successfully deployed. And that's, oops. And that's what we're getting back from our uh, policy. So match labels in this pod disruption budget match a subset of match labels uh, in PDB1 in this case. It could have been PDB2. It depends which one's evaluated first, but this one is PDB1. Okay. So. So the next thing I'm going to talk about uh, is mutating admission policy. So this is something which has only just made it into the Kubernetes code base. It's going to be in 132 as an alpha release, uh, whereas validating admission policies, they first hit alpha 126, there were beta 128, and then the G8 and 130. So mutating admission policies are to mutating webhooks what validating admission policies are to validating webhooks. They run in the API server. Uh, they have a policy, a binding, and resources, parameter resources, the same way as validating admission policy does. Uh, but we have a, a mutation section instead of a validation section. And we can, we can create either server-side apply configurations or we can create JSON patch configurations. So let's take a look at those. Right, this is an example of the apply configurations with server-side apply. I will go back to the command line. Okay, so this is the policy. Now this policy is looking for pods which do not have an apply hello label already set, and if it finds one, then it will just mutate the, the uh, pod to have it, okay? So we will go and create that. I'm sorry, uh, apply it first. And apply the binding. Okay, so we've created a deployment. We'll go back and have a look at the workloads. Okay, uh, we have pods there. Oop. I have to, let me just do that again. I've obviously left something running for before. Okay. Okay, so now if we take a look at the pod, we can see that that label exists. So that's come from the mutation that we did. Uh, JSON is similar, uh, but it's a bit more, it, it has a bit more options for us because we can add values, we can remove values, replace values, copy values, move values, and also test values. This is the same except it's looking for JSON hello instead. Oops, sorry. So this is the same, but it's looking for JSON hello instead. A label of JSON hello, but again, it's doing a mutation and adding the label if it doesn't find it. So we can apply this. I go back to just do that. Create it again. I go back to, to look at the workloads and take a look at the pod. We can see now we have the label JSON hello world. So that's the JSON patch working and mutating it. Uh, okay, so that's it. That's where we are up to. Uh, I don't know. We've got 39 seconds left. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't see the clock from here on the podium. It's, it's a bit hard to see. Um, so if there are any questions, please <laughs> ask them quickly. Uh, if not, you can catch us at the end of this and ask questions. It's a, your choice. No questions. Is that good or bad? Oh, we have a question. Do you want to come to the mic and ask the question? So I think we've all dealt with the downsides of validating admission controllers. 
uh, or specifically validating admission and mutating webhooks, yep. right? Like that'll really get you in trouble. Uh, what are the downsides to implementing the same patterns using cell and validating admission policies versus webhooks? Uh, so I, I guess you're, uh, I mean, there are some obvious advantages like no network, you don't need to worry about the servers going down or anything. Uh, but there are some constraints as well to it. Uh, you can't make remote accesses to anything from a policy, uh, admission policy. So if, you're, if you need to do that for any reason, then you, um, you, you, you can't do that. Uh, if you need, if you depend on multiple different types, then there are additional steps that you have to do. So the only real way to do that is to have a controller which monitors those types and then creates an individual parameter CRD, a custom resource, which then feeds into the policy. So there's an extra step there of creating a, a controller to do that. And obviously that can potentially get a bit unwieldy. So those are the, the real ones I can think of. You got any? Wow. Performance I mean, impacts to the API server overloading the API server and killing the API server as they're being evaluated? So each, each of these uh, expressions, they all run with a cost budget, but uh, until 132, uh, when this, this finally uh, gets enabled, uh, they actually forgot to add in the cost estimator for a lot of the extension functions that we use. So it went GA without the cost estimator. Uh, they put it in as a deprecated feature flag, feature flag. That feature flag uh, will be turned on by default in 132. So now you will be constrained uh, by resources because of that. So you shouldn't uh, do that. You shouldn't overload the API server. Do you know what the budget number is offhand? Say again? Do you know what the budget number is offhand? Uh, not off the top of my head. No, not at the top. But I think it's, no, I don't remember, but we can check that. Thanks. You're welcome. Sorry, somebody said something, I missed it. Uh, yeah, 10 million per rule and 100 million for the entire resource. 10 million per okay. rule and 100 million for all the resources. There you go. Thank you very much. Um, for the JSON patch stuff, yeah. uh, can you use cell in writing the JSON patch or is the patch just static? Oh, no, it's a, a cell expression, so you can oh. use it to generate it. Cool. Yeah, you can create whatever you want using cell. Yeah. No oh, worries. Oh, sorry. Uh, just so it gets recorded and people can hear the question. Uh, just quickly, is there uh, tools for doing unit testing of your validating emissions policies so you can run them in CI and make sure that they're doing what they should be doing, not blocking things they should be allowing, not allowing things they should uh, be blocking? That is starting to come through. I do know of one which is called VAP Library, if I remember rightly, and they do have some way of testing it as part of CI. Uh, I haven't tried that myself, but I, you can certainly look at that. And I know that within the cell playground, we're going to add that anyway as a capability, so it may well be that we'll have it in both. Thank you. You're welcome. What about exceptions? What about exceptions? What do you mean by exceptions? <laughs> like um, the privileged container example, QProxy. I don't want to block QProxy. Oh, you, you can uh, create whichever ex exceptions you want, really. I mean, if it's something to do with uh, not wanting to apply it to resources that are in Kube system, and when you set up the binding, you can exclude it that way. So you can see you set up the selector for the namespaces or the resources to, to match however you would normally do it. So you but, can. But then so it you might could be like a really really long rule, right? So you could uh, do it through labels. those selectors, right? So you could do it, define it in the binding, but that is where you can also do it through like match conditions, right? So you yeah. can basically use cell in match conditions to say. I want to exclude this particular thing. Like, it gives you more granular control over which workloads within that namespace you want this condition to match for and not do it for others. And the other advantage of that is that you can use things like authorizer to, so you could actually base it on who's making the request as well. So maybe you have some people who you would allow to do that and some people who you wouldn't allow to do it. So you can use authorizer to check whether they have permissions to do that. So based on the RBAC stuff. Any more questions? All right, well, hopefully you managed to get something out of this. That's certainly our intention, but thank you very much for coming and thank you very much for staying to the end. Thank you. Thank you very much.